Um, so over the last few Sundays, we've been working our way through these last um, few chapters of the book of Psalms. And the common theme of these Psalms is that exhortation that we see in this passage today to praise the Lord. Now, I wonder what comes into your mind when you think of praise. If I were to give you a piece of paper and you had to draw on that, on that paper what you thought of when I said praise, I wonder what you'd draw. Maybe some of us would draw a music artist on a stage with thousands of adoring fans screaming their name. Or maybe some of us would, would draw a sports star um, on a podium like we've seen in the, in the Olympics, um, but this time actually with, with thousands chanting their name. Or maybe even a church service with hundreds of people singing in praise for God. But how many of us would draw a picture of the sun and the moon and the stars, or of mountains? I can't imagine many, if any of us, would do that. But that's what we find in our psalm here this morning. Let's have a look down at verses 3 and 4 um, of the passage. It says, Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the sky. It's all a bit shocking, isn't it? We think of praise as being human-centred. I imagine lots of your pictures of praise would be full of people. And that's not completely wrong. You know, the psalmist does talk about people too later on. But what's he up to when he's focusing on creation? But before we dive into the passage to get our answer, just a quick word on the structure of the psalm, uh, which is actually deceptively simple. Um, so at the start, we have that exhortation, praise the Lord. And then the focus in the first, in the first four verses is, is on things which are far off. So the heavens, the skies, and so on. And then we, in verses 5 and 6, we get the reason that they are to praise God. And then as we go into the second half, um, again, we've got that exhortation, and then the focus is on the earth. Um, and again, it ends with the reason. So there's a beautiful simplicity to it. It's like a choir in two sections. The psalmist is like the conductor of this cosmic choir, saying, you lot praise God, and then you lot praise God. It's, it's beautiful poetry. And we're going to take it in three parts, and in three, three different headings. And our first heading is that the far off should praise him. The far off should praise him. So this is focusing on verses 1 to 6. And we see a progression by the psalmist. He starts with rational, supernatural beings. Verse 2, we have the angels. They are told to praise God. And then he moves on to the heavenly hosts. So that's the Lord's armies. And then he moves on to non-rational beings. Let's have a look at verse 3. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Now we know that at the time that the psalmist was writing, the Babylonians and Egyptians would worship created things. They would worship the sun and the moon. And I guess people doing horoscopes now is a similar thing. It's thinking that the stars can influence life down on earth. But the psalmist is saying, you've got it the wrong way around. You worship the created order, but the created order is here to worship God and praise him. And then f finally, um, verse 4, we've got the highest heavens and the waters above the sky. So the latter, that's just another way of describing rain, particularly in a positive way. And then in verses 5 and 6, we go on to the reasons why creation is to praise God. And they're twofold. Look at verse 5, we get our first reason, for at his command they were created. So God made all these things. That's the first reason. And then the second is because he established them. Look at verse 6. He established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. That is to say that more than just bring these things into being, he sustains them. He gives them stability and structure. So that's the why. Why these far-off things are to praise God. But then the how. How can these created things praise God? It does seem a bit strange on first sight, doesn't it? 
We think about praise as being something that we do with our lips. We do by singing or by saying. So how can these inanimate things praise God? The sun can't suddenly start singing to him, can it? Well, we sometimes use the same language in ordinary life. Say, if you hosted a birthday party and your friend came along and they dyed their hair green, you talk about them making a statement, wouldn't you? Or if you went down to Hampton Court on the Thames near Richmond, you might talk about how the architecture and the decoration speaks of royal confidence in the time of Henry VIII. And I guess in the same way, the created order praises God by showing us what he's like. As the psalmist puts it in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So the powerful forces of creation give praise to God by showing his even greater power. The beautiful aspects of creation praise the Lord by testifying to the even greater beauty of the creator, and the ingenious parts of the created order point to the even greater intelligence of God. So that's one aspect of how creation praises God. And another is that it does so by faithfully and obediently playing the role that was prescribed to it in creation. So the sun praises God by faithfully shining by giving out light. The rain praises the Lord by watering the earth and enabling crops to grow. They faithfully play the role given to them in creation and point to the goodness of God's design and to God himself. So we should stop and when we look at the world around us, take time to look up and marvel at the awesome creator So take the planets and the solar system. It's easy for us to become numb to the incredible size and beauty of the universe. I think we've got a picture here um, from the Hubble telescope. um, And they estimate that this photo alone contains 5,500 galaxies in a portion of the night sky that is smaller than one-tenth the size of the moon. And they estimate that this is just one thirty millionth of the whole sky. So in every thumbnail-sized photo of the sky, there are untold numbers of galaxies, stars, and planets. It's absolutely mind-boggling, isn't it? The amazing size and beauty of the solar system show us just how powerful and awesome our creator God is. And so as we walk outside along the street and look up at the night sky and see the stars, we're walking into a cacophony of praise, of an orchestra which is playing the tune, praise the Lord, just by its very being, by performing its part and role in this awesome universe, and by pointing to the creator God. So I guess one very simple application of this is to enjoy creation's praise. Climb mountains, enjoy sunsets, sleep under the stars. And as we do so, we can deliberately and consciously connect the wonders of creation to the even more wonderful creator. Parents, I I can't speak personally, but I wonder if one great way to talk to your kids about God is to take them to experience beautiful nature and landscapes and say, look at this amazing stuff and talk of how it points to an even even greater God. Now, you might be thinking at this stage, all very well, but my experience of nature is not just amazing galaxies and beautiful sunsets, but it's also earthquakes, natural disasters and cancers. Sure, on David Attenborough, we might see the majestic march of the penguins, but one minute later, we're going to see a polar bear tear to death a baby seal. 
when we read in the news of floods in Europe, washing away houses and possessions, creation's praise seems to be overpowered by cries of anguish. Paul talks in Romans 8 of the whole of creation groaning as if in the pains of childbirth because of the effect of human sin, people's rejection of God. We live in a world where praises are intermingled with groans. So at this stage, it's easy for us to just read this psalm as some beautiful and pious fiction, this great ideal of creation praising the creator, but far from reality. And we're left with this conundrum. How can creation unambiguously praise the name of the creator? What will it take for this world to point to our Lord God in a unanimous way? And as we read on in the psalm, we find our answer. But let's, let's go to our second heading. So that's the all on earth should praise him. All on earth should praise him. And this is verses 7 through to 12. And just as we started the first section with the rational, before moving to the non-rational, here we do the reverse. So we start with the non-rational. Let's look at verse 7. Praise the Lord from the earth you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. So the psalmist starts with the sea and calls on all the creatures that are deep in the ocean. And this is a list of things which would have been terrifying to people at the time, but which the psalmist reminds us are under God's authority. At the time that the psalmist wrote, the sea was a place to be feared, a, a place of treachery, the storms would ravage ships. Families would wave off their children on naval expeditions, but would sometimes never see them return. But the psalmist is saying, God is in charge of the sea and the ocean depths. They too are to praise him. And that should give us some comfort. God is sovereign over the worst that nature has to throw at us. And then look at verse 8. The lightning and the hail are to praise God, the stormy winds that do his bidding. We think of weather as something inconvenient that gets in the way of our plans. But the psalmist is saying that the lightning and the clouds and the storms are here to praise God. The winds are part of his plans. And then the writer moves on to the hills and the mountains. Verse 9. And just as in the first section of the psalm, he started in the high things and came down. Here he does the reverse. He starts in the deep oceans and then goes up. Now, I don't know if you've ever played the game Animal, Mineral, Vegetable. Um, we used to play it a lot when I was uh, growing up, trying to pass um, car journeys. Um, the title really gives it away in terms of what the game is about. Um, I guess someone has to think of an animal, a mineral, or a vegetable, and then everyone has to guess what it is by asking questions, um, which can only be answered by yes or no. Um, I remember being pretty infuriated by my younger brother when we used to play this when we were younger. Um, he would choose the most obscure chemical element possible, and then we would promptly not get it within 20 questions, and then he would insist that it was his go again, and we would go around and around and around. Um, but anyway, the best way of playing the game is of being systematic. Um, so if, if you know that it's an animal, then you know, narrowing it down in terms of categories, so asking if it's a fish um, or a bird and so on, crossing each op option off um, to make sure each possible option in the animal kingdom has been covered. And that is what the psalmist is doing here with the flora and the fauna on Earth. He crosses each of them off. He makes it clear that absolutely all of them are to praise God. Absolutely, absolutely everything down on earth is to praise him. And he does this through the use of pairs. So often in the Old Testament, um, the, a writer would use polar opposites to describe the extent of something. So when um, a writer might be talking about all Israel, he would say from Dan to Beersheba, because Dan was in the north of Israel, Beersheba was in the south. So from Dan to Beersheba, will be all Israel. I guess the equivalent for us might be saying from Carlisle to Portsmouth, 
to say all England. And we see this in our passage. So when um, the writer says um, for fruit trees and all cedars, he's not saying just fruit trees and just cedars are to praise the Lord. He's saying absolutely all vegetation. And we've got more examples of polar opposites as well as we go on. And we've got the wide a- wild animals, so those that can't be tamed. And then on the other hand, we've got the farm animals, the cattle that can be tamed. So from the birds in the sky to the creatures on the ground, all animals are to praise God. So how do they do this? Well, again, they praise, they praise God by being what they, were made to, what they were made to be and doing what they were made to do. So animals praise the Lord by multiplying and being fruitful. Trees praise the Lord by bearing their fruit in season. They praise God by fulfilling their function. And as before, they also do so by showing us what God is like, by their variety, by their order, by their creativity. They point to the awesomeness of our creator God who made them. Take a spider's web. I think we might get a picture up. So I guess just look at the beautiful symmetry and patterns there, the way that it shines in the light. We can see the ingenuity of the spider to decorate the web. And so it will attract insects as prey. The beauty and creativity of the web shows us that God is just like that himself. And now the psalmist moves on to humankind. Look at verse 11. Kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. Again, there is no distinction, no matter the position, the age, the gender, all people are to praise God. And that applies to all humankind, whether they are a believer or not. And that applies to us, ordinary men and women like you and me, are to praise God. And we know that that is a standard that we ourselves fall short in. Rather than live to honour and praise God, we ourselves seek the praise. At work, we want to be promoted to the head of our team or to take on more responsibility. Not to, not to fulfil our role according to God's good design or to point to him, but rather because of the ego boost that it will give us so that we get praise from other people, we get compliments. Or maybe when we, we're in conversations with friends or, or others, we want to be the ones cracking jokes or telling the most in- interesting stories, not to give praise to God, but so that we're at the centre of attention. Now, I guess it's a matter of motivation. Making jokes and taking on more responsibility are good things. But if we look at our hearts, in so much of our lives, are we acting to give praise to God or for our own glory? And we can see how ugly it is wanting to be the object of praise. It shows our own pride. It's putting us at the centre of the picture And we can see that in doing that, we are not recognising that everything is from God. We have not recognised the created order. So rather than praise God, mankind rejects him in their hearts and in their minds. And that's true for you and me. So again, that cacophony of praise that should be pouring forth from mankind is muffled. With man left to themselves, their praise of God falls significantly short. It's a distracted, disjointed praise. But that isn't the end of the story. Let's move on to the final two verses of the psalm and our final heading, which are the reasons to praise God, the reasons to praise him. So verses 13 and 14. And the first reason is, that, is there in, th- in verse 13. Um, Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. So this is saying that there is God on the one hand and everything else on the other. God is above everything else in this universe, including us. Now, it's a very simple truth, but it's easy for us to get this wrong and kid ourselves that we run the show. 
but everything owes its existence to the Lord, and he rules over it as king. And then we come to verse 14, which has our second reason. Let's, let's look at that. It says, And he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Now, on first reading, it's easy to read this as a bit of a postscript. I mean, we've had verses 1 to 13, and we could think that verse 13 is a fitting conclusion to that. But now suddenly in verse 14, this is talking about the church, God's people, whereas the first 13 verses had been addressed to everyone, whether they're a believer or not. But verse 14 isn't some kind of ill-fitting postscript. No, it provides us with an answer for how this psalm can become a reality, of how creation and mankind can praise God perfectly. It's where this psalm reaches its climax. So what's going on here in this verse? What's this horn all about? Well, at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, Harold Godwinson, the King of England and the talisman of the English forces, was shot by an arrow from a Norman archer. The Bayer tapestry depicts it as going through his eye. I mean, there's a bit of doubt about historically whether that individual in the, on the tapestry is, is Harold or not. But anyway, imagine after the battle in which um, William the Conqueror defeated the English forces, that bow, which was used to slay Harold, was hung up in the Norman court um, of William. It represented the victory that had been won over the foreign English forces. It was a symbol of strength and victory. And that's a bit like what's going on here with this horn in this passage. The horn represented salvation and victory for the people of Israel. It's already been referred to in Psalm 132, so slightly earlier in the Psalms. Let me read from that Psalm. It says, For the Lord has chosen Zion, that's Jerusalem. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will clothe her priest with salvation, and her faithful people will ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grown for David, and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame. And the whole book of Psalms has been a search for the horn that will come from David. The search for the one that will be a leader, a leader and a champion for the people of Israel. For the one who will defeat the enemies of God's people and bring God's people close to him. The horn looks forward to a future king. And, in, and fast forward into chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel in the New Testament. We read of Zechariah, a Jewish priest, who is told that his son would grow up to be John the Baptist, a kind of warm-up act to God's long-appointed rescuer and saviour. And so understanding that, when John is born, Zechariah is overjoyed and bursts into song. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 68, in that song... Zechariah sings, Praise be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Here we have in the New Testament a man of God singing Psalm 148 just before the birth of Jesus. Jesus is this horn. And Jesus is God's answer to our praise problem. Look at verse 14 again. He has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Jesus was raised up in the family line of David. He was raised up on a cross to die for the sins of his people. And he was raised up to rule at the right hand of the Father, highly exalted and given the name above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. He is the one who fulfills this psalm. Jesus was the one who lived a perfect life of praise. And it, and it is through him 
that creation will perfectly praise God. So how does this happen? How does Jesus make a way for creation to perfectly praise God? Well, the Bible talks of Jesus returning to earth and bringing in the new creation. And in Revelation, at the end of the Bible, we read of the new creation where all creatures are singing praise to Jesus, the Lamb who sits on the throne, to whom all honour and blessing and glory forever and ever shall be given. We can think of the Psalms as a microcosm of the whole Bible narrative. And here at the end of the Psalms, we have this sequence of them, which are encouraging us to sing hallelujah. The climax of the Psalms, the climax of history, is all people singing God's praise. And in this way, Psalm 148 acts as a window into heaven. We know that this psalm is fulfilled in an incomplete and imperfect way in the world around us. We know that creation and humanity's praise is inadequate. But this psalm will be fulfilled perfectly on the last day where Jesus brings in the new creation, when all creation will perfectly praise God. All groaning, all anguish, all distraction will be taken away and God's people will praise him in a way that is unanimous and untainted. So how are we to respond to this? Well, take, take a look down at verse 14 for one final time. Look there, we have the horn described as the praise of all his faithful servants. Jesus, this horn, is the praise of his people. For all those ways in which we sin by seeking praise for ourselves, Jesus has paid the penalty through his death. He has taken our sin, our rejection of God, on himself. And in Jesus, we can praise God that there will be order. We can praise him that there will be a day when every action and every thought from humankind and from creation will praise him. And it is as we grasp all that Jesus has achieved that that will turn our hearts to praise. So a couple of points about how this passage can shape our praise. Well, firstly, we can praise God out of love and gratitude. I'm sure you've all been at um, at that situation where a young child is given a gift by an older relative, an Auntie Molly, say, and their mum says to them, make sure you say thank you to Auntie Molly. And the child trudges off and says, thank you, Auntie Molly, in such a way that they don't sound the least bit thankful. And how easy it is for our praise to be just like that, our praise of God, to be out of duty and out of ritual. But this psalm shows us that we can do it out of gratitude, gratitude at God creating this world and sending Jesus so that we can be part of that new creation. And secondly, we can praise God out of humility. We can be part of God's choir, not through anything that we've achieved. We remember that by nature, we ourselves want the praise. It's all been down to Jesus. He's the one who's made this psalm, a way for this psalm to be a reality. He's the one who's achieved this, not us. So that should humble us. So as we wrap up, when asked to draw a picture of praise, why does the psalmist draw a picture of creation. Well, because in the new creation, everything and everyone will be praising God perfectly. Jesus brings that in and makes it possible for us to be there too if we trust in him. So first and foremost, let's praise God for Jesus. Let me lead us in a prayer now as we close. Lord God, praise you so much for sending Jesus, that horn, that all creation and all mankind will praise you perfectly in the new creation on that last day. And pray, Lord, that you would help us now, help our hearts to praise you in all that we do and all that we say. Amen.